It's been the glimmer of hope this morning, the first international aid bound for northwestern Syria since the quakes hit Monday. A convoy of six trucks carrying tents and medical supplies, aid that was already heading to refugees in the region, but was delayed because the quake damage closed the roads. A spokesperson calls it the first of the aid headed for the opposition-controlled area. So that is, as I said, some good news to the people we've spoken to today, UNICEF and some of the other aid organizations working in the northwest of Syria, likely will be to my next guest. Someone from whom you've heard before his story for the past 10 years, we've talked of Dr. Anas al Qasem. Uh, the co-founder of the Canadian chapter of the Union of Medical Care and Relief Organizations. There are dozens of Canadian doctors in this. Born in Syria, but working in Ontario, but he travels to Syria regularly to provide medical care to people, of course, dealing with the, uh, the effects of the ongoing civil war. Five hospitals he works with, including one major centre in Aleppo, and so a perfect uh, voice to talk specifically about, my goodness, uh, the injuries and the death and the devastation and how the medical community is dealing with all of this. Dr. al Qasem, welcome back to the program. We're glad to see you this morning, sir. Good morning, Helen. Thank you for having me. I have so many questions, but I want to begin with the personal <laughs> family and friends. Do you have people who've been affected and are in the, the quake zone? So I don't have that first degree family members, Heather, but I do have a lot of physicians. If you imagine I've been going back and forth to Syria, northern Syria, to help with my organization for the last 10 years of the uh, war uh, in Syria. And, and there are physicians that we lost. There are families that I know personally that we lost, that we have been working with for the last 10 years. It is a big tragedy. I mean, the scope of the of the death and devastation is just overwhelming. As we bring in some pictures, the drone imagery has been so striking. Just the scenes of building after building just completely leveled. As you have looked at the images of the country where you were born, what has been going through your heart and mind? Well, imagine, Heather, these are people that, to start with, they are internally displaced. Many of them, they don't belong to this region. They were forced to northern Syria and they've been living in very tough uh, circumstances for the last 10 years. They tried to build their own basic buildings to shelter their own beloved people and, and families. They are from Ghouta, from suburb of Damascus, and, and so forth. And imagine these uh, same people now, they're struggling with one of the worst earthquakes that hit this area probably over 100 years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been difficult for us to get the degree of information we've had from Turkey, for example, out of Syria. So what are you hearing from people there in terms of, I don't know, the devastation of Aleppo or just the scene around people? So suburb of Aleppo and Idlib was hit significantly uh, because the buildings, as I said, they were built in not a very good circumstances during the war. They're not solid buildings. Uh, there are no codes there. Uh, they were rushed to build them to uh, shelter the internally displaced people to start with. So these people have been damaged uh, significantly. We're still hearing about people being rescued out of the rubbles, but it has been more than 48 hours, Heather. As you can imagine, it's going to become less and less uh, hopeful to, to get more people out of the rubbles. But just to give you some perspective, in the five centers that we operate and support, these are not big hospitals like, uh, you know, St. Mike Hospital or uh, General Hospital in Toronto. There are small hospitals with one or two ORs with few physicians and nurses. They received over 1,000 injuries in the last 48 hours. They did more than 200 surgeries. Just to imagine the amount of pressure of all these kind of injuries. And add to this, Heather, it's kind of zero degree now in, in this, these areas. So people getting out of the rubbles after 48 hours, there's hypothermia, there's severe cold injuries, uh, and they need uh, loss of surgeries like uh, fractures and uh, orthopedic surgeries. And then they need shelter and medicines. And we're talking thousands of people, not hundreds. It is uh, devastating. And it's likely to continue for the foreseeable future because there are still many thousands of people who are still missing in the aftermath to all of this. I, I wanted to speak to you specifically about what's happening in the hospitals with which you're affiliated and the medical colleagues you have there. So can you give us a little bit more detail? So they're, they're small. They're obviously overwhelmed right now with, with the numbers. Just again, any more information you can give us in terms of the kinds of things that they're having to treat and what they're dealing with? 
Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, the, these are very fragile people to start with. Uh, children, women, internally displaced. Uh, they have been suffering for years, poor, poor communities. And now uh, they, they sustaining all kind of injuries, um, especially hypothermia and fractures, as I mentioned. And the equipment, Heather, and, and the, uh, the supplies available in these hospitals are not, not a lot to start with. And they have very limited human resources. We're talking about but uh, a few of orthopedic surgeons, a couple of spinal surgeons, uh, and, and a few nurses here and there. So to deal with this influx of hundreds, uh, if not thousands, of injuries all of a sudden on a daily basis, it, it's not easy at all. Uh, for, for example, they did more than uh, 300 blood transfusions, and they need a lot of blood. But where do they get it from? <laughs> it's, it's so devastating because either you have uh, you know, suffered yourself your building collapse, or you're trying to help others, uh, you know, so people are not even available to donate uh, blood at the current time. You, I understand, are planning to make another of your trips there. This under a different, you've dealt with all of the aftermath or the ongoing effects of the ongoing war, and now you're going to be heading there to something that is even greater in scope. What are you going to be doing and what kind of help are you taking? So, so since my experience in the, in the, in the war in Syria and my background as a trauma surgeon, uh, we are going as a group of, of Canadian surgeons uh, from, from Canada, and we're trying to help. We want to do some need assessment quickly. There, there are going to be lots of supplies needed and equipment. Uh, we need to help them. Emotionally, it's very important even to go there for a week or so um, because they are exhausted. They are tired, as I mentioned, physicians, nurses, staff. And then uh, we need to uh, utilize the donations we're getting in the right spot for the right equipment. Mm -hmm. um, I ask all uh, organizations and, and the government uh, to donate uh, as soon as possible. And I want to, uh, you know, ask the, the Canadian government always ha has taken a lead in this humanitarian uh, kind of crisis uh, to I urge them to keep the borders open. As you know, I, you said at the beginning that the borders were shut down for a long period of time. They just said yesterday they will open them up. I think these borders should be open uh, ultimately and uh, regardless of the uh, vetoes that happened, unfortunately, in the past by China and Russia. Well, you've led us into exactly what I was hoping to speak to you about uh, to conclude our conversation today, and that is the difficulty of the political situation. Now starting to get those first aid trucks into the northwest of the country, the first in yet. But um, the word is, the reporting out of Syria is that President Assad is controlling or wishes to control all of the aid coming into Syria. The sanctions are posing a difficult situation for countries in terms of how to respond. France, for example, Dr. al Qasem has said just this morning, it will deliver aid through NGOs and UN mechanisms. So that's what it's planning to do. What are your thoughts on how really sort of the world, I guess, should, how it should navigate the difficult situation in Syria? The Heather, we, we cannot rely, uh, unfortunately, on the Assad regime in Damascus because the Assad regime destroyed the northern country, uh, the northern cities and towns throughout the 10 years of the war. And, and, and we have to rely on a cross-border um, uh, humanitarian aids. And so we have to keep the major three uh, border checkpoints open between Turkey and northern Syria. This is the only way we can get the aids, get the humanitarian equipment, the heavy machinery to remove the rubbles and, and, and all these kind of supplies as soon as possible. And I think I agree with the friends. We have to rely quickly on the trusted NGOs, on the charities, and on the UN agency uh, to be able to deliver these aids. Remember, the roads are damaged, uh, and it's not going to be easy. Even if you open the border today, probably it's going to take you a few days to, to deliver these aids and humanitarian equipment to, to the uh, damaged uh, areas. But I think we should rely on cross-border and not on the uh, Damascus government, unfortunately. Okay. The need for the help that you and your fellow doctors will be providing is, is great there in Syria. I hope you'll be able to give us some time once you land on the ground. I'd very much like to speak to you again once you see, assess things and get working at helping save lives. Thank you so much again for the conversation. Be more than happy. Thank you, Heather, for having me. Dr. Anas Al-Qasem in Hamilton this morning.